Wow, this is great. Uh, I find I'm like uh, Melissa and Annette. I'm from the arts, of course, not um, the uh, um, mathematics, but I found great inspiration that in the bell ringers, the, um, that uh, one of the solutions was, by, was made by the bell ringers themselves, not the mathematicians. So that gives me hope. <laughs> So here, I will just start my uh, screen. Okay. So I am uh, exactly an artist and I was, I'm, my goal, my overarching goal with my practice and my research has been to help uh, children improve their drawing skills. And it comes from a personal place of, you know, when I was a child, I was an artistic child, but there wasn't a lot of uh, explicit drawing instruction and and the arts you know tend to lack sort of explicit language around instruction and um, so I went uh, about four three or four years ago I read a book called Shape by George Steine and uh, Seeing and Doing and it was about shape grammars and and his uh, invention of shape grammars his and James Gibbs and I thought I wonder first of all it was while the book resonated with me as an artist, I found it also extremely difficult to understand in parts and, and a huge steep learning curve. And I'm still, I'm still learning it, I'll, I'll be honest. But I um, thought, I wonder if I could use this in a children's art class because my, my favorite group to teach is uh, from six years old to 12. And so I, uh, I started, I, I tried and, uh, and then I decided to do some research. So this, uh, presentation today is based on uh, a, a fairly large research project I did where I had 78 students um, and I, I did pre and post testing standardized um, because I wondered uh, in my research I asked the question if if children were to learn to logically uh, draw would that improve their drawing would it improve their expression and uh, and would it improve uh, aspects that um, have become quite um, attractive to education, which are, you know, visual spatial perception, spatial reasoning, thinking, and these types of uh, uh, skills that are uh, being like, you know, are, are considered favorable at the moment for uh, children to be learning. And I had a hunch that they would. Um, so I started um, the program, uh, this program, and then I started to research it. So uh, I'll be showing you today only one grammar, which is the Y grammar that we used. We used uh, about five. And, uh, and then the children, you will see, they start using them on their own. So, um, and one of the, um, so what the Y grammar was uh, the first grammar that I introduced. And uh, it's, um, I'll just, but before I introduce it, I have to show you that I had to first introduce birds. Um, just let me turn my lights. Sorry. Sorry, it's still the, it's still really nighttime here. Uh, I mean, morning, nighttime, that is. So there, that's a bit better. So in order to introduce, in my pilot, I tried to introduce a schematic right away. And I was promptly met by uh, some very angry um, seven-year-olds who said, this didn't seem like art to them, this seemed like math. So I promptly stopped that and we went back to drawing. And so I had to, I realized, you know, nobody can learn anything until they feel a need to learn it, right? So I thought, okay, so how are we going to learn this? So I thought, well, let's start with songbirds because it's a project that I do a lot with children and um, I, um, move on here. So it's a project that I do a, a lot with children. And, and one of the reasons I do it is for two reasons, two main reasons. One is uh, it's fairly easy to draw a songbird and every child can usually have their own songbird to draw. So there's not a lot of comparison between children's artwork or it eliminates a lot of that. And um, the, they're just lovely things to study. And um, we, because there's so many different different variations within songbirds, everyone gets the uh, experience of, of going down their own road of exploration. And yet as a teacher, I can kind of pedagogically teach it standard, in a standardized way. So it's a wonderful project to start with. Uh, so uh, I asked everyone to choose one of the color handles. So this is how I start with a schematic now. 
so I, I start with the songbirds. I, every, there's a pile of songbirds. Everybody chooses one. And I ask them, I tell them we're going to draw it and we're going to draw it multiple times. And we're going to start with charcoal on big pieces of newsprint. And I ask them to draw the bird. I give them three quick rules. I say, I want you to draw your bird. I want you to look at your bird. I want you to draw your bird. And I want you to work fast. And, and then the fourth rule I ask, I say, I want you to try to consider uh, structure. So I want you to try to draw with, with shapes. And we talk about, we do a quick, especially depending on the age, we talk about simple shapes like circles, squares, triangles, nothing more advanced than that. And I usually end up with something kind of like this on the first go of it. And so here we see on the, on the left, this was a child that chose, oops, we see on the left that this is a child that chose uh, a blue jay to draw. So this was the child that chose the drawing from before. And this was their first attempt at drawing it. Now, it doesn't <laughs> exactly look like the bird from before. However, there's, there's a lot of uh, good in this. There's a lot of potential. What I see is that the child is obviously frustrated. It was done very quickly, so that's fine. Um, and, but they have used basic shapes, but they haven't transformed them in any way. And they haven't, uh, uh, it, they haven't, they haven't done it logically. So there, things are out of whack in the drawing. And, and that's okay, because when we go on to the next, uh, and, but the one thing I want to point out is the frustration in the drawing. The child has uh, scratched out the face because they're not happy with it. And this is what happens a lot in drawing classes. And it's what promotes the notion that I can't draw. And, and also feeds the belief that drawing is a gifted innate activity that people either have it as the gift to be able to draw or they don't. And so my uh, reason for the that uh, for light is to try to dispel that. So now we're going to go on to, this is the final drawing of the, uh, of the Blue Jay done by the same child about one hour later. Now, why did that, it seems unbelievable the change, right? But the change isn't actually unbelievable when you start working methodically and, and, and giving children the ability to use their logic to draw. So uh, what we did here, and what we can see is in this detail is in the finished drawing is a complete turnaround. It's almost unbelievable, but at the same time, the more I do this, the more I realize it's not unbelievable at all. And it's, but it is like the lights have been turned on and, and because the bird has also become alive. And part of the reason is, is because uh, they've started to use shapes in an embedded recursive way. And I think, anyways, that's my theory of why, but, um, as we worked through, like this wasn't the second drawing, this would have been probably the fourth drawing. So we do very quick sketches, warm ups, and um, and these warm ups are, uh, you know, the, the, after the first drawing, we would do some warm ups quick as a class because everybody's drawing kind of looked like the first child's first drawing for the most part. I'm going to show you a child that's considered the artist in the class in a second, and um, so that by doing that, I started to show them quickly how shapes can uh, be used in a way that can actually uh, delineate your form better. And so then I realized too, why I started doing the birds first before I go straight into a schematic is because the whole point of the logical expression is to compose it, but also decompose it. So from an artistic perspective, we, we delve a lot in the decomposition of, of structure rather than, even though we do compose it, of course, when we draw our pictures or paint our paintings, we really, artists only really talk to each other at the critique stage, which is the decomposition stage. So we don't really uh, get involved at this point, but I want to try to change that a little bit because I think that we're losing some of the skills that are vital for for not only the ability to draw, but for other things that seem to be lagging in our visual spatial uh, perceptions of our children or how they, how they use these skills. So I, we looked at the, um, uh, I just have to minimize our screens here, sorry. There, we looked at the, uh, uh, when, I, when we went through this, so that we could talk about, I could talk to them about the rotational geometry going on 
here where we have our rotational symmetry, sorry, with the reiteration in our, we would call this the reiteration of form where the child has taken a shape and it's really repeated itself one, two, three times. And same here where you start to see the shape starting to appear again and again, like the, they're repeating it, repeating it. And I found that the, the children could see this and we could talk about it in terms of this schematic and this kind of logical way, but we could also talk about it a little bit as metaphor, because I said, when this happens, when you start doing this, you're, uh, you're adding movement to a still, to your still drawing. So all of a sudden, that's why your bird seems more alive as well, because you are actually, the eye of the viewer looks at this and it keeps the eye moving and it moves throughout your picture. And so then uh, you start to learn how to um, use these techniques to, to forward your drawing. Now, just as a slight backwards, yeah. this, kid, this child was uh, in this class that I was in, they were considered the artist of the class. And they were, this child is a very good drawer. But uh, you can see that this was the other type of first drawings that I would get um, often is, uh, and usually by children who can draw quite well, is contour. They try to draw the entire shape as a contour. And, um, and unfortunately, this, can, this, makes, this is a very stressful way for a child to draw often because uh, they, you know, it's all or nothing. If, if you lose your, like as, as the child here lost in the first drawing, uh, lost the mass a little bit of his, uh, of his picture of his bird, the downy um, woodpecker. And by doing that, uh, he uh, was, uh, th the bird doesn't look quite as full. And, and it, while it's a bit stilted here, where when he starts working with shapes, it became much more uh, uh, like, uh, not, not really alive, but much more full. He, the volume is there and everything. And again, you can see repeated patterning happening. And part of this is just also looking closer at your, at your object and your subject. Now here's a child who had no drawing experience. And so here, but tried to do a contour drawing first and was extremely stressed by the end of it. And, but when we talked about it as a class, like everybody could understand the stress because everybody's been in that situation. I've been in that situation as a child even as an adult, like where it's like, oh my gosh, why didn't I use the underlying structure? Why did I start this way? But he pulled it off, he pulled it around. And, you know, just by, we just talked about the idea that when you draw with contour, what you're actually drawing is you're trying to draw all the shapes already merged together. So it's an extraordinarily complicated shape. And even for, even as a songbird, it seems simple, but it's actually a massively complicated thing to try to draw without, uh, uh, logically breaking it down and moving forward that way. So we moved in then to the branch grammar. Now the branch grammar was the easiest grammar we used. And it's basically, um, the, just there we go. So basically the, the, in shape grammars and, and in the idea of logical calculating, there's something on the left of the equation and the arrow denotes that it will be replaced by something on the right. And so usually it is um, uh, done with uh, these operations of addition, subtraction, and transformation. We didn't use subtraction, or I didn't use su subtraction explicitly with the children. I, I stuck with addition and transformation, mainly because, I mean, like Wittgenstein said, I think, uh, about subtraction of shapes. Like if we kind of cared about the subtractions of shapes after you add them together, we might change how we think about arithmetic because I mean, when you subtract two shapes, you're, you're making a whole new shape. I think that this was, in, it was enough at this stage to just deal with uh, things that they could just see and more, work more additively. So, um, and there are three kinds of emergence and that uh, are produced when we're using these shape grammars that, um, the children started, I would use this language with them to anticipate what they want to draw. Think of the possibilities, but prepare for the unanticipated. And the beauty of this, uh, as they started to learn, was that it is um, really uh, an ambiguous process. Even though it seems to a, an art mind, it seemed at first a bit, it seemed kind of rigid. In fact, it's quite the opposite. So 
how I got introduced the schematic, the original, the Y grammar was I showed it to them. But before, just before I did, I said, we have these birds. We need to have something, we need to finish the drawing. We can't just leave them lying in space. And uh, the ones that I showed you before, they had actually gone against the grade and thrown in a background before. Uh, but I had asked everybody to just draw the bird, to not put it on anything. And I said, so we're going to need a, a branch for the, the bird to uh, perch upon. So we went with, um, uh, so I showed them, you know, we looked at literally a branch and I said, okay, so we're going to find something for a bird to perch, perch upon and we're going to use something from nature. Let's use a tree branch. So no, you know, for this project, I kind of di didactically said, we're going to work with trees. And, um, and so I asked, what shape is this? And they said, why? And then we um, went forward with uh, going on to, um, sorry, I'm just, okay. So then we introduced the Y grammar. So then it was a lot easier for them to understand because there is the, uh, I said, so we're, we're going to, I had the X and the X plus Y, but I don't really talk about that until later in the course. I just always have it present. So they, they know that it's there. But I say to them, I say, don't worry. There, this is exactly the same as this. The, what you see over here is the same uh, operation as you're seeing here. So what I'm going to ask you to do is uh, we're, we're going to put a point and wherever we put a point, we're going to put a Y. And um, and so then I give them a further rule. I say, what I want you to do is I want you to have your, take your bird paint picture, which were about uh, 11 by 14 inches. I can't remember how many uh, centimeters that is. But, um, and I want you to in the low, anywhere you want on that periphery of your picture, I want you to put a point, just one point. And then um, I said, and now I want you to follow this rule. And so, you know, there were a lot of questions at first, like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, it says wherever there's a point, you should put a Y there, you would add a Y. So you need to add a Y. <clears throat> and I said, and be, while you're doing it, I said, this is going to be eventually with the eventuality that this is going to hit your bird somewhere where they can perch upon it. So you have to make sure that you're working towards your bird somehow. Uh, whether it's a circuitous route or straight on, it's up to you. But you have to eventually, your why will have to get to where your bird can stand on it. And then, um, so everybody did it. And every, there was a lot of questions, how big can I do it? How, and I'm just like, I, I don't know. It doesn't, it depends. As long, as long as you're following the rule, you can do whatever you want. And um, so the rule was, and I'd repeat the rule. And so then they would do it. But then of course, there's only one iteration of that that thing. So I, everybody stopped and I said, so now what do you do? You can't do anything except if you see a point, put a Y. And so we, we talked about it and I said, well, how about make a new rule? So then we made the next rule, which is that where you see the diagonal line on the Y. Um, I actually, this isn't the exactly how I drew it with the kids. With the kids we used, uh, we actually did a Y with a point on the bottom, a Y with a point on the bottom, and then it will be replaced by the same Y with adding two points. And, um, and so, oh yeah, there was the, so the needing uh, a, a, a branch or something for the birds to perch on. So, and many questions followed, of course, like I was inundated with, how much do I do? How many times do I draw the Y? Do I have to point my Y in the same direction? Can my lines be squiggly? Do they have to touch? Do they need leaves? Do they, uh, is this right? Am I doing it right? What's it supposed to look like? And I, in every question, I, I would be able to answer, which was a real relief as a teacher. And I didn't realize this would happen. But when you work with rules, it's an absolute uh, dream for an art teacher, because in every case, you can point back to the process and say, Are you, the rule is, is this. So as long as you're following this, you can do anything else in that, within that parameter or outside that parameter. And so uh, some people did like this person and only did one, one. Most people didn't do that. And in part, children are hilarious because 
really, I mean, this person was very focused on the family, the story already taking place with the baby and the eggs and, and the worm coming in and the mom and dad or two dads, two moms, whatever's there. So this was their focus for that day. So that was fine, but it's, it's interesting. They did do the rule though. So that's fine. And, um, but what happened for me as a teacher, which was interesting is I expected, this was my assumptions coming into this type of a project. I, I like, you know, like anyone, I had my own set of assumptions and I just assumed that everyone would put their point uh, near to the bottom and would come straight up and we would be looking straight on at the birds. And, and anyone who teaches art, especially drawing and painting, especially with young children knows that you never uh, teach multiple perspectives at once. But what happened was a multiple perspective um, because I gave the, the ability for them to choose where they put their point. Uh, and I just assumed they'd choose where I would choose. And uh, they started to choose all over the map. And so, and what happened then, so that was interesting when they chose the different uh, places to put their point. But what, but after once, uh, we're sort of going through this in three stages. So they first drew the bird, then they drew the branches. And then I said, okay, now let's finish the drawing. What is your bird doing? Where is it? Blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, and, and I gave them a very quick um, horizon line uh, blurb on like, you know, do you know about the horizon line? Most kids, in fact, did not. Uh, but, you know, where the sky would meet the land, where your eye would go to. And so I said, so put in a horizon line wherever you like on the page. And I said, and, uh, and then finish your drawing and tell your story. So we started, I started to notice that the perspective was switching. It was, it was shifting from all being one, which normally happens in an art class when you're teaching, you teach one perspective at a time. You teach one point, then you teach two point, then you teach three point or multiple perspectives or, or have you. But the children started, here we have a, a bluebird on um, uh, up in a tree and the viewer is above, the, a little bit, three quarters above the bird because underneath the bird is above a sidewalk um, in a park in the city. And here we have a bird at the top of a tree and down at the bottom is a, is a park with a bridge and there's uh, some little guys fishing and, and fish are talking to the guy and stuff. But, you know, it's all of a sudden we're way up high looking down. Uh, here is an interesting Loretta, one. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, you, you have about one or two minutes left. Oh my God. Otherwise okay. we're cutting into your question time. Okay, so, okay. Yeah. So I'll just, I'll just go really fast. So here we have, your, you're behind the bird, you're on a lattice, you're overlooking a hill down at the bottom is a, uh, uh, you know, sun setting and, and, uh, and a house. And so then we moved into trees. So most children draw a lollipop tree but immediately using the Y grammar, uh, they were, the trees just exploded in, in their uh, detail and their abilities. And it, like, it was, it was shocking to me how good they got. And kids were amazingly shocked. They're, you know, very excited at what they could do. And their parents were very excited. And it, it, it was so simple. There were a few who struggled who would try to go back. But as you can see on the left here, this child, uh, they regretted their decision is all I can say this they, they got frustrated they they wanted to stick to what they knew and every time I would introduce a grammar this would happen there would always be one or two that might not be quite ready to go yet maybe they're legitimate peripheral participators you know they need to watch their their, their friends go first but um, you start to see that the the why started to be used all over the place inside the suns inside uh, when we did our tree houses, they immediately start designing with Ys and look at the perspective on the branches. Here's an emergent uh, where we were just working with symmetry. And I said, just start with a Y and, and do both the same on each side for a while. I was just randomly saying, let's just try, let's just see what happens. And, um, and then I said, okay, now take paint and see what you find in there. And so we started pulling uh, images, objects. Here was a, a geodesic sphere from later on when we did geodesic spheres, we drew from hand. Everything we used was our haptic senses. I didn't allow uh, rulers or 
anything like that. So they, even the circle, they had to do it from two points where they created curves and then they did uh, reflective uh, triangles. And, but then this child was finding cubes and then saying, hey, this could have actually been done with a Y grammar as well. Uh, y is that were done from a point in the middle using only one and then uh, turned into seeing the, the three dimensionality with cubes. The Sierpinski's triangle, which somebody's parent had showed them about uh, on a free drawing day, a kid was doing this. And then you'll see like they, in the, up in the, their log, they put in Y's in the, in the buildings and they created what they called a bridge city. So it's a city with a highway on either side and it's like a boulevard and it's a bridge over water. And, and then they had geodesic and stuff and from some of the other grammars. And I'll just end with this. This is a beautiful part where I think that they took this. So the question might be, could it be imaginative? Uh, absolutely. This child uh, did this first design for a tree that was gonna be a, about a three foot by four foot painting where we were doing tree houses and we were gonna just do the, the tree house in the trees. And so this was her initial design. She changes the grammar a bit, like she does have the Y's coming out, but then she's added uh, a, a new rule of the, whoops, of the thing. But what was cool is the metaphor. She, when she did the real one at the end, she changed it to all these, it's like waving hands. And I thought that was really beautiful and then used the Y as well in the, in the setting sun and stuff. So I'll just leave it there. These were their sketchbooks showing that they were, their sketchbooks were at home. I never saw them till the end of the term. And so they were doing uh, calculating in their sketchbooks at home alone. Okay. And this is children's reflections. I will stop here though. So I will uh, leave it at that.